So let's open in a word of prayer, and then we're going to look at this. Uh, Lord God Almighty, we just thank you for this opportunity to come and meet with you. Uh, Lord, we want to partake of your word tonight. That's why we've come here to receive. Lord, I pray that you just uh, cause us to be open to what you want us to hear and understand tonight. Lord, that you will meet with us personally and that you'll minister your word personally to us, Lord, that what we need to understand, you will enable us to understand, and that we will be able to grow. Lord, we want you, the presence of your spirit here to anoint your word, to anoint me, and to prepare uh, each of us to receive. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, and we say this in the name above all names. Amen. We're going to begin at Amos uh, 5.18. As you know, Amos was a call to basically Israel. And uh, he was a, a, a shepherd. And he took care of trees. And this is the only time he was called. He was called once. But he has some powerful, powerful messages to Israel. And it's for the church today. As I study Amos, I'm thinking, man, you could have placed him in this time and you would think it's for this time as you get into what he says because this is where America is. Uh, this is where a lot of people in America is. Uh, this is where some of the organized church is. And I mean, it's a real warning. And we need to really wake up to that warning I do not believe that uh, the, the church is preparing the people for what's happening and what's on the horizon. And when you look at, at these books like Amos, he's trying to even prepare us. And we're talking about all these years ago. You know, when uh, Israel was, uh, you had Israel, the, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes. You had Judah, the two tribes. Uh, the southern kingdom, and of course this is mainly to the northern kingdom, but he's also going to speak to uh, the southern kingdom of Judah. And so, uh, you know, he started out warning all the nations around Israel, but now he's warning Israel. And the attitudes that I have seen with Israel I see today, and it is very disturbing to me. And I think, oh God, wake us up. Wake us up. Because he has some really uh, powerful things to say. And you're going to see what I'm saying. Uh, so if we start at Amos 5.18, uh, this is called bitter wo woes. Because he's going to say woe. Okay, woe. And uh, you're going to see that in 18. Woe <laughs> unto you that desire. Notice what he says. This really concerns me. Desire the day of the Lord. Woe to you. In other words, a tremendous sorrow, a lamentation to you for desiring the day of the Lord. Now we're asking Jesus to come. Think about what I just said. But would he say woe to you for that? Now we need to understand why. Amos is saying woe to them because it's not going to apply to everyone. Okay. Uh, you can ask Jesus to come quickly, but here's the key. Are you ready? You see, Israel wasn't ready. And if you're not ready, it turns into something else. And we're going to get into that. He says, woe that you, uh, uh, are asking, you know, that you desire the day of the Lord, to what end is it for you? And he said, why are you asking for it? Why are you asking for the day of the Lord? Why? Why do you desire it? Now, remember, the day of the Lord represented to them a new kingdom being ushered in. But what they didn't understand is that before the new kingdom comes, comes the trials and the fires and the separation because God's going to have a pure people. Isn't that what the Bible says about Jesus? He's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, 
That's what he's coming back for. And so he's coming back, all right, the day of the Lord, but it's not to usher in a kingdom. Okay, and that's what he wanted them to understand. Why do you desire it? Why do you look for it? The day of the Lord, now notice this in 18, is what? Darkness to you. He says it's going to be judgment to you, not deliverance. It's going to be judgment to you and not light. Wow. Now that's pretty serious. That's pretty serious what he's saying there. Okay, so what we're going to see is four woes being pronounced. This is the first one. And, of course, uh, it points to the fact that what is being pronounced is irreversible. That's why it's going to cause tremendous sorrow. It's going to cause limitation because they cannot reverse it. So we see where the people desired this day. However, what they didn't understand is that that day would represent judgment to them. It would not represent deliverance. It would represent judgment. It wouldn't represent a new kingdom. It would represent judgment because they were in sin. People, if you're in sin, don't ask the Lord, come. Okay, don't say, okay, come. If you're in sin, deal with your sin. Deal with your sin. Repent. Get it right with God. All you have to do is turn around and say, Lord, he's waiting for you. And yet, how many people will do that? How many people remain stiff-necked? Say, no, I'm not turning around and repenting. I'm okay. You heard that psychology. You're okay. I'm okay. No, we're not. If God hasn't dealt with our sins, we're not okay. So the day of the Lord would be judge, darkness of judgment to those in sin. And most of them were in sin. Okay? And that's what he's saying. They were unprepared to face the light of the wondrous kingdom that he could and would usher in eventually. Because what they're looking for is a kingdom ruled by their Messiah. Okay? But he's got to, first of all, bring judgment or separation. Now, sin can only bring judgment to those who are not ready. Please hear me. If you look at the warnings in Matthew 24, for instance, what does he say? Don't say to yourself, oh, the Lord comes another day and go out and live like the devil. He said, don't do that. This is what they were doing. They were living like the devil. And, and basically he says, don't, don't you understand? If I came at that time, you would be under judgment. You would not be ushered into a new kingdom. So let's look at 19. And he says, woe to those who desire it. That's a, that's a first woe, okay? Uh, that we're going to see some more woes here. Because... There's going to be four woes. One is ignorance. This is here right now. They're living in ignorance about what's going to happen. Denial about it. The second one is going to be indifference. You're going to see indifference. Sin always causes indifference towards God. And then the third woe is going to be indulgence. What do we see in America today? And uh, the, the fourth one is imprudent. It's where they are going to basically be um, mocking. You know, uh, well, it's not going to happen to us. And, you know, it's going to happen 20 years from now. I'm not going to be here. We're going to get into that. Uh, because it's, it's very much, how many, to, you know, today you hear, well, he's not coming now, so it's going to happen some down the not, Sometime down the line, I can live however I want. This is how these people were looking. I can live however I want. Because you know what? It's not going to affect me. No, but it's going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your grandchildren. Don't you care about them? Well, you know. I see that indifference today, by the way. I see that attitude. So we're going to look at all of these because this one, of course, is sort of an ignorance about it. You know, uh, I desire it 
in ignorance. You're in sin. You can't be ignorant, okay, about what's happening. So let's look at uh, uh, 19. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him or went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and the serpent, serpent bit him. Now what are they talking about? He's saying that nowhere, no matter where they go, they're going to be judged. Okay, they're going to be judged. If they run from the lion, a bear is going to get him. If they manage to flee the bear, guess what? There's a serpent waiting for them. Now, some believe this has uh, got a couple of different fulfillments in it. One is uh, we've seen this with Israel already as far as nations. The lion is England. The bear is Russia. And the serpent is the Antichrist. And there's going to be, you know, under England's rule, no place would take them. Because it was during what? World War II, Nazi Germany. And Russia, they're after them right now. They're using the Muslims, but they're after Israel right now. And when the Antichrist comes and steps on the scene, he's going to do everything to try to wipe Israel out. So no matter where you run, you're going to encounter judgment. And remember how many poor Jewish people suffered under Russia and all their uh, programs against them. And they, no matter where they ran, they were always being faced with persecution. And so we've been sort of seeing that right now. But he's saying that's going to happen to you when... This great judgment comes on you. We're going to get into how that all happened. So let's look at 20. Shall not that day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? One of the things that really concerns me is that judgment people is very dark and there will be no brightness, there, no, there will be no hope in it. But one of the things that I hear is, oh, God loves me. Yes, God loves you. He gave his son for you. But people, he provided his son so you could be saved. If you reject his son, you're rejecting his love. Please hear me. They walk hand in hand. Well, God loves me. We have this idea of God's love based on the world. Not on God himself, okay? And so God loves me, but people... God hates religion that has no heart. He hates religion that has no godly substance. He hates religion that has no true worship. You can hide behind all these things, but God sees you. And he knows what's in your heart. So don't try to fool yourself, okay? He knows what's in your heart. He despises practices that have been corrupt and perverted. He will not smell the fragrance of your sacrifices or your life. He will not accept any of your crumbs you throw at him. Because he's looking at your heart. He's looking at your motive. Why are you doing this? If it's surface, guess what? It's unacceptable. Everything has to come from the heart. And that's what he wants people to get down to, is the heart, okay? And he's going to say that. I hate, notice that. I didn't say that. He said it. Well, God doesn't hate. Excuse me? You can't love without hating. Okay? I hate, I despise your feast days. And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies, okay? Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offering, I will not accept them. This is all 21, 22. Neither will I regard the peace offering of your fat beast. I say, how many of us in our so-called little religions are offering God, uh, offering things up to God? Oh, aren't you pleased with me, God? says, excuse me, 
That offering wasn't about me. That worship wasn't about me. It was about you and all your religion and your sentiment and all whatever else. You know, people, uh, God can't accept the fleshly. He can't accept what is from the flesh. He can't accept it. No matter what covering or title we put on it. Okay? He will not accept your offering. He won't hear your worship songs. Because they'll be like sounding brass because of their indifference towards righteousness. So you have the ignorance where, you know, Lord, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for that day you come back. No, you're not. Or you'd be preparing for it. Or, Lord, here's my offering, really. And yet you're indifferent. Towards my spirit, towards my word, towards my commandments. You're indifferent. Now that's pretty tough, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Take, take thou away from me the noise of thy songs. I don't hear your songs. I will not hear the melody of thy viols. The musical instruments. So I'm not hearing it. You wonder how many... Churches today, if the Lord spoke, he'd be saying that. I get a little concerned. He said, I'm not listening to your songs. You may be impressed with them, but I'm not, okay? So let's look at what he goes on to say in 24. Now this is what he wants. He wants it from you and I too. But he says, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. I want you to think about what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to become just people based on my law. I want you to become righteous based on holiness. Based on your calling. I want, that's what I want from you. That's all I want. Well, you don't understand, Rio. That means I have to consecrate my life and get real? Yeah. You mean I have to humble myself before God and obey him? Believe and obey him? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. But my question is, is he not worthy of it? Is he not worth it? To me, he is. Is he to you? Because if he's worth it, you'd be willing to give it up all to gain him. To please him. To make sure that what you offer to him is acceptable. And he can approve of it. That it is just. And that it is righteous. That's what he wants from each of us. It's very simple. He's not asking you... Reform yourself. He's asking you humble yourself and let him have his way in your life. Let the law, the, 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 the spirit of the law have its way in your life. Let his desire for you have its way. Now let, let's look at this for a minute because he's going to remind them. He's in verse 25. Have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? He said, don't you remember when your forefathers were in the wilderness with me and I established that religious life, that temple, that tabernacle among you to show you how you could worship and serve me. Do you not remember that? Forty years I kept you. Forty years I fed you. I gave you all that you had need of, okay? Okay. Isn't that enough for you to love me? But look at what he goes on to say. But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Shem, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourself. What is he saying? You erected a golden calf. You allowed the worship Moloch in. You erected images. That's what you did. That was your sign of appreciation to me. Yes. What are we doing today in America? What kind of images are we erecting in America? What kind of altars are we erecting? Are they idolatrous? 
Are they all about the world instead of God? Have we let the Molochs of the world in so much we can't tell the difference now? Who we're worshiping? Who we're honoring? So he brings them back to their history and their refusal to turn back to him in real repentance and insisting on holding on to idols and worship at pagan altars. That's what he's reminding them of. Here you had it all and look at what you've done. Now, therefore, what's he going to do? Verse 27, therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus. He's talking about Assyria right now. Saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts, the creator of all hosts, the one that oversees all hosts, Jehovah, the covenant keeping God. He keeps the covenant, they don't. And the covenant was the law at the time. So let's go to chapter 6. Now we're going to hear another woe. Woe to them, verse 1, that are in ease in Zion. Trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Now what's he talking about? Well, Zion has to do with Judah. Samaria was the capital city of Israel. What he's saying is that you think because you're on this mountain in Zion that you're, you're infallible, that you can't be brought down. And because you have a great city named Samaria that has all this power and might, you don't think that you have anything to worry about. But you're wrong. This is what he's talking about. So he talks about, in verse 2, Pass you unto Shkalna, I will try to get this right, and see, and from thence go you to Hamath and the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms? Are their border greater than your border? You don't understand. These are defeated people. He says, I want you to go down there and see how they fare. Didn't they have great kingdoms at one time? Didn't they have great cities, great armies? And where are they now? They're not there. They've been defeated by the Syrian army. You have to realize the Syrians became an empire. They were over the whole known world at the time, practically. That's what an empire is. And they were taking over these different places. And they were taking people into captivity and bondage. He says, how they've been faring? Go over there and see what's going on with them. You that put far away the evil day and caused the seed of violence to come near. What he's saying is you are denying what's going to happen. You're putting it off and yet you're allowing the violence to draw near to you. In your ignorance. In your denial. In your wishful thinking. You see people, a lot of us Operate in wishful thinking. We wish that doesn't happen. We wish this could happen. Okay, we live and serve a wishful thinking idea which is in denial. Now that these people are going to go into captivity, you can read about it. And in 2 Kings 17, 6, that the Assyrian army came in and took them over. Okay, you can read about that. But we want to live in ignorance. We're coming back to ignorance again. We want to live in ignorance by wishful thinking, self-denial, and delusion about what is on the horizon. As Thomas Gray reminds us, where ignorance is bliss, tis folly to be wise. Think about that. Where ignorance is bliss, it's a good thing that you operate in folly. Because if you really had a clue what was going to happen, you would be sitting there shaking in your shoes. That's what he basically is saying. Because in ignorance, we can remain foolish. We can operate in a silly way. Because we're not taking anything seriously that God's telling us. And so... This has been the pattern of history throughout Israel. They have refused to turn back to him in real repentance. 
and insisting on holding on to their idols and guess what? Worshipping at pagan altars. That's what they insisted on for years. Okay, you can't get around that. And they would go into captivity. The Syrians would come in and who, what they did not kill and destroy and it was a bloodbath. Don't kid yourself. They would take into captivity and disperse them among other foreign people so that they could never gain power again. That's how the enemy keeps you from gaining power, is dividing and conquering you. And so that's what they would do. Now, people perish for lack of knowledge. We know that from Hosea 4, 6. People perish for lack of knowledge. If you have no vision past yourself, you're going to perish, according to Solomon in, in, in Proverbs 29:18. It's all there. Can we afford ignorance? As Christians, we can't. We can't be ignorant of God's truth. Because if we insist on ignorance, we're going to be in darkness. And we're going to be unprepared to face the challenges looming on the horizon. I want you to hear what uh, <clears throat> Paul said in Acts 17.20. I mean, Acts 17.29 and 31. I think it's 30, sorry. 30 and 31. Oh, and unreal. Acts 17, 30 and 31. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. Notice he said it was the time that God used to wink at ignorance. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. Who's that man? Jesus Christ. And whom he has ordained. He's ordained Christ. Whereof he has given assurance unto all, unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. That's the crux of the, of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose three days later. And if we believe he has rose, we will be saved. It's all about the bottom line of the gospel. Okay, now we are not called to ignorance, but truth. Okay, for truth will set us free to trust God. That's the key in all matters and to be confident of the promises that await those who endure to the end. People, we have great promises and we encounter these glimpses of these promises as we walk through this world but there are such greater promises waiting for us why would we accept this world let go of Christ get into this world when we have such great promises waiting for us the Bible says but he that shall endure unto the end the same shall be saved this is Matthew 24 13 we have to endure we have to overcome. But we do it by standing on the word of God. We do it by believing God. We do it by obeying God because we believe him. We do it because we want to know what's going on. We want the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth. And to warn us of things to come so we can be prepared. We can't afford to be ignorant about the days we live in. Or living in denial about the days we live in. We are living in Christ is coming, people. He's coming. He's coming for a church without spot and wrinkle. And sometimes that means he has to put us in the washing machine. Sometimes he has to run us through the fires. Sometimes he has to let the fires come our way. But he is going to be presented a chaste bride. So am I prepared for that preparation? Well, do, am I asking God to bring it on? No, but I'm saying, God, have your way, but please enable me. Prepare me in these days to stand as the light. Now, we are given a sure word of prophecy, people. It's word. His word tells us what we need to know. Do you believe it? Do you, do you look for it and say, God, show me what you want me to understand? Don't let me assume I know. I want to know. I want to know. And you can show me by your spirit. So there will be no excuse for ignorance when he does come, people. There won't be any excuse for ignorance. Bottom line. 
So here they are, here sitting in this indulgence because they're living in ignorance and denial. How much of America is sitting in indulgence? Okay. Let's look at this, verse 4. He's, this is what he's going to talk about. That lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall that chant to the sound of viol and invent to themselves instruments of music like David that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. They were living in ease. They were living. They were indulging themselves with the things of the world. And they were indifferent. You know, the more that you become tied into this world and dulled down by the world, the more indifferent you become towards God the more indifferent you, you become to the people around you. The more indifferent you become to your calling. And they were totally indifferent. They didn't care. They lived the life of ease and luxury. You have to realize that if you don't invest in your spiritual life, you have no substance in which to stand you have no foundation in which to stand on you what is going to enable us to stand today is godly character and that's formed in you as you walk out the word of God it's formed in you as you go contrary to the things you're used to that's how it's formed in you character is never formed on the couch of ease it's form going against the grain and the currents. Okay? And they were just being fatted up, and that's what we learned uh, the last time we were together. They were being fattened up like cows for the slaughter. That's all they were being. And here they say, oh, wait, we want the day of the Lord to come. Yeah, you're really ready, right? You're really ready for that. You have character, right? You have godly character. You have real strength, right? You have moral character that hasn't been compromised. I don't think so. They didn't have any of that. You have to remember God looks at your heart, which means he's looking for strength of character in you as well as your heart attitude towards him. We can't ignore the spiritual dimension of life because it will lead to shameful defeat. If you don't invest in your spiritual life, you're going to end up in defeat. Okay? So we see this indulgence going on. Is there anything new about this attitude of ease? No. Look at Matthew 24, 46 through 51. Let's keep your fingers in Amos, but let's look at that because that's pretty well what it says there as well. We're living in those like days. You know, there's a couple of things that never change. God and mankind. Okay? They don't change how they do things. They may live in different societies and cultures, but they never change. They do the same foolish thing all the time if they don't get regenerated and born again. Matthew 24, 46 to 51 of course, this is the famous scriptures. We've all read them many times, right? Whoops. Did I get that right? Probably not. <laughs> no, it doesn't even go there. Uh, no, I'm yeah, in, 24. yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm in Matthew 25. That's what gets me in trouble. Okay, 46. It says, Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. Boy. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him. And in an hour that he is not aware of. And shall cut him asunder 
and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There you go. <coughs> we are living in a life of ease, but when we do, it's at the expense of others. You have to keep that in mind. For these people, they were living at the expense of others, and they were basically lovers of pleasure. And you can't, if you're a lover of pleasure, you can't be a lover of God. Okay, and that's what it basically describes by Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 4. He talks about the lovers of pleasure instead of lovers of God. When you lack a love for God, people, and you're pursuing the pleasures of this world, it will be clearly seen in society as it spins out of control. So how's our society doing? Because we have pursued the wrong things instead of God. The pursuit of the pleasures of the world, which all dulls you down and eventually will destroy your desire for God, it usually takes a crisis in society to bring people back to center. And that's the harsh reality. We have crisis now, and God's trying to bring his people back to center before he has to pour his wrath on them. It's a very serious time. They're laying all the stuff up for themselves. But think about this. They were like Luke 12, the guy who built all the firm, the barns for his wealth. And what did God say to him in Luke 12, 21? But God said unto him, Thou fool, <laughs> this night thy soul shall be required of thee. So is he that layeth of treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. When nations get pleasure mad, guess what? It's a sign that the end is near for that nation. When they get pleasure mad, it's a sign that the nation's coming to an end. So I want you to look at uh, uh, verse 7 here, okay? Because of this, therefore now shall they go captive with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. He says, guess what? You're going into captivity. And the reason why is because they didn't have a burden for the sins, for their sins are the sins of the nation. And, and people, this is true for us. We have, we should, I don't know about you, but we should have a burden for this nation. We should have a burden for the sins. We should have the burden for the church. We should have a burden where we cry before God and say, Oh God, have mercy. Oh God, show us our sins. Reveal it to them. I have a burden. My spirit is vexed over this nation. My spirit is vexed over the condition of the church. I'm not talking about every church. I'm talking about the visible church. Most of them remind me of insane people. Okay? Where is the preaching of the gospel? You are sinners if you have not been born again. You need to get born again. Where's the urgency? Where's the call for repentance? If you're worldly, if you have idols in your life, you need to repent. How important is that, right? Now, one of the problems is, as we're going to see, is these people boasted about their victories. They boasted about how they had great accomplishments. They never gave credit to God. And yet it was because of God that they had all those things. And we're going to see this, that they boasted about it. Oh, well, this is our accomplishment. Who's going to bring us down, right? So look at that. The Lord 
God has sworn by himself, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city with all them that is therein. Okay? And it shall come to pass if there remain ten men in one house they, that they shall die. They were boastful. Look at our palaces. Look at what we've done. And no credit to God. No credit to God. And he says, guess what? I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to bring you down. You're going to die. Now I want you to think about what he's saying here. It shall come to pass if there remain ten men in one house that they shall die. That points to pestilence, by the way. You can't quite get away from those. Pestilence. Yeah, disease. You can't get away from that. And so there, there's these people that's going to try to save their life and they're still going to die. But I want you to see what happens. There's something that amazingly as I, I, uh, I studied this. And a man's uncle shall take him up and he that burneth him. In other words, they have to burn their body. So that pretty well shows this pestilence going on. To bring out the bones out of the house and shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house. If there's is there any, is there yet any with thee? In other words, is there anybody else in there? And what's he going to say? No. No, they're dead. Now look at what, is that, what he says. This, this shocked me. Because these people were very casual and flippant about God. They probably used his name in vain. They didn't fear him. But all of a sudden, they're in a fight for their life. They have come under judgment. So look at what it says. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. He says, Don't say anything, because if you do, you could bring more judgment on us. If they had that type of awe and respect, they wouldn't be here. If they walked that narrow line of righteousness, they would not be here. And now, because of all this judgment, they're going to have this tremendous fear and dread of even using the Lord's name wrong, which meant bringing more destruction on them. You say, well, why didn't you get wise before that? Well, they're stiff necked. They were blinded. By it. For behold, now notice this in 11, the Lord commandeth. In other words, the Lord commanded this. They recognize that He commanded the Assyrian army to come and do that to them. They recognized it. Even though they have been warned, when it actually happens, they're going to recognize He did command it. That what that prophet said back there, what was said back there was true. And they were not wise enough to listen, okay? The Lord commandeth, he will smite the great house. He's talking about the tabernacle. He's, he's talking also about Judah here. He's talking about the palaces. He's talking about the, the temple. He's talking about all these places. He's going to smite them. He's going to destroy them because of your sin. And so he's going to smite the great house with breaches. In other words, they're going to make breaches in there and they're going to come in. The enemy's going to come in and nothing can stop them. And then he says, and the little house with cleft. In other words, wherever, the smallest hole, the smallest place they're going to get in. And they're going to destroy. Whether it's pestilence, whether it's a sword, whether it's an arm, they're going to destroy. Now, I don't know about you, but I would pretty much be a little concerned. If a prophet told me that. Now notice, he's going to use some reason with them. You know, there's things that you know, reasonable, okay? So he says, shall horses run up on the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? For he have turned judgment in the gall and the fruit of righteousness in the hemlock. What is he talking about? He says, you know that you won't run a horse on slippery rocks. You won't use, you know this, right? You won't use an oxen by itself. You'll use two to plow. 
My question is, if you know these things that are obvious, why don't you recognize what is going to be obvious? And what's going to be obvious, and what is obvious now, okay, is that they have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of righteousness in the hemlock. In other words, they're poisoning themselves as a society. He says, can't you see that right now? Isn't that obvious by the fruits of your society? What's obvious to you and I by the fruits of our society? Let's be honest. We're watching a fiasco in our government. It's a sham. It's a shameful thing to see. It is. It's a shameful thing. It's demonic. People are allowing Satan to use them to be accusers and slanderers. And, and they think they have every right. And they've sold their souls. And they're totally uh, indifferent to the truth. They have no idea. It's a spiritual battle, by the way. And we need to fight that spiritual battle. They were not going to stop this repercussion because guess what? They were poisoning their own society by what they were doing. They were poisoning it. And he says, can't you see that? Now notice what he says. You which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? Again, this is where they're boasting. They're boasting. You know, at first look at what we have. Now they're saying, well, we've done this ourselves. We're boasting. This is where the impertinent attitude comes in. We're boasting about it, okay? They don't give God any credit. You know, there's something God hates and he'll judge. It's called unthankfulness. He's going to judge that. And we are... We can be very unthankful people because we're very spoiled. Are you thankful for what God has given you? I am. I am satisfied with what God's given me because that's what I need. Okay, he says, I will give you your daily bread. I'm satisfied. Because the more that I allow him to fill my life up with his truth, the more satisfied I am. Because he's filling my life up with himself. And there's nothing that's going to satisfy your soul more than Christ. There's nothing that's going to satisfy, satisfy your spirit than Christ. And as you fill your life more and more with Christ and his word, you're going to become more and more satisfied. Now notice what he says because of their boasting. Okay, 14. But behold, I will rise up against you a nation. He's talking about Assyria. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering in Hamath unto the river of the wilderness. What is he saying? No matter where you run, they're going to find you. No matter where you run, they're going to find you. You will have no hiding place. And guess what? Your priests won't save you. Your false prophets won't be able to save you. Your army won't be able to save you. Your king won't be able to save you. You're not going to have a king. Therefore, you have no authority. No one will be able to save you. Why? Because there's only one deliverer, and his name is God. And he delivered you and I, through his son, Jesus Christ. There is no deliverer outside of that. So we are seeing here uh, the indifference and insanity of Israel's reason, aren't we? The same reason we are seeing today in our society, in different arenas. Such people justify themselves in their own eyes. It's not how I do it. It's just getting the end results, right? It doesn't matter if I'm being right or just. It doesn't matter if I'm destroying somebody or sacrificing them. It doesn't matter because it's all about the results. No, to God, it's about how you do it. God works out the results. If, he, if you're in line with him, he'll work out the results. 
So what we see, God's going to bring these type of individuals down in complete judgment. You know, as I watch our politicians, I want to say, do you realize one day you're going to be brought down in complete judgment? And the way you judge is how you're going to be judged. The way you have treated others is the way you're going to be treated. You are bringing and heaping such tremendous judgment on yourself that you should be ashamed of yourself and you should be shaking in your shoes and trying to remedy it before God Almighty so as we come to the close of this I want you to realize how much we are living in the days of Amos this is for us this is a warning to us as a nation it's a warning to the church it's a warning to us individually. But what I want you to know today, we have a Savior. We don't have to accept the judgment of God. We're not under the judgment of God. If you have truly come under the redeeming justification of Christ on the cross, what he did for you. You don't stand, judge. You stand in the light of life. But you've got to make sure you're there. And Satan's going to want to try to destroy you. He's going to want to try to rob you of your faith. To rob you of your testimony. Cause you to compromise. So he can bring accusations against you. But I want you to know God has given you everything that you have need of to stand, to withstand, and to continue to stand.